many of you are thankful for the blood of Jesus this morning? How many are thankful for the resurrection of Christ this morning? It's in him that we find our freedom, our hope, our truth, our faith. Can we just worship him together this morning?
Isn't that what we came here this morning for? To give glory to his name? Then come on, praise him. Praise him once again. Let's celebrate. I was just blown away looking at the Friday picture. Because without Friday, I was telling the first service, without Friday, you have no Sunday. The blood has to be shed in order for us to be clean. But thank God that we didn't remain on Friday. Thank God that the world didn't end on Friday. And even though sometimes we are struggling in life as, as, as if we are going through Friday stuff, the ugly stuff, the suffering, the difficulties, and then Saturday came. Everything was quiet. Hope was out the window. People thought that that state was going to be permanent. But Saturday ended and Sunday came. And with Sunday came Resurrection Day. With Sunday came victory over sin. With Sunday came promises fulfilled. And the glorious power of our Savior. So come on, celebrate, celebrate that we have a reason that the tomb is empty and that he is living still at the right hand of the Father. Thank you for joining us this morning. Happy Easter, everyone. Just close your eyes for a minute and let's thank God. Thank God. Thank you. Thank you. We just want to say thank you for the blood applied on Friday. Thank you because you fulfill your promises on Sunday morning. And now we are able to call you Father. We are accepted into your family. You have reason, and we have reason with you. And now we have the Holy Spirit empowering us, guiding us, helping us through life. And we get to be called your sons and daughters for your glory. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone agreed and said... Amen. Amen. Everyone agree and shout. Amen. Happy Resurrection Sunday, Life Point Church. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to see you here. What a beautiful day it's been already at Life Point. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us. Thank you to all of you joining us online, all of you in the overflow. Welcome. It's a beautiful day, as I just said, in the neighborhood, right? <laughs> if this is your first time, we like to issue you our three-week challenge. That's basically give us three weeks, kind of get to know us, find out if this is where you feel God is leading you and your family to make it your church home. And if this is your first time, please stop out front. Our, our, um, our team would like to get to know you, and they have a little gift for you before you leave today. And if you've already passed through the three-week challenge, and maybe this is your fourth week, and you're wondering, well, what do I do now? Well, starting point is going to be your next step. That's going to be next Sunday, um, the April 7th. It's already April. So we have this class the first Sunday of every month, so it'll be next week for the month of April. And in this class, it's a one-time session. You just get to learn a little bit more about LifePoint. You get to learn more about our mission and our values, um, how God has given all of us, all of you, gifts, and uh, where you could use those gifts either to serve in His kingdom and or to connect with others in a life. Uh, in a life group. We know that relationships are built in smaller, more intimate settings, and we have a ton of life groups where you can connect with other people. So if you're interested in that, you can sign up out in the lobby uh, at the Connect Point table, or you can hop on our website, lpcmentor.com. Also next Sunday is Baptism Sunday, another very exciting day here at Life Point, and our numbers are climbing. We're so excited. The number of you that are taking that step to publicly declare your faith in Jesus, but if you've not had a chance to sign up and you want to get in on that, you still have a few days left. You can sign up online at lpcmentor.com, or you can stop over at Connect Point and sign up on one of the iPads as well. 
It has been a very powerful Resurrection Week, starting from Palm Sunday through Good Friday. We had the 12 hours of prayer here. Obviously, today we're here celebrating our risen King. There's been a lot of Dream Team members serving, and a countless amount of people that have made this all possible. So why don't you give them a round of applause for, for being here and being faithful. So with that said, um, there's been a lot of rehearsals, a lot of work, and uh, we think that uh, a rest is needed. So normally this Wednesday would be first Wednesday for April. We are not having it, so make sure you take that off your calendar. We're gonna have an awesome April, but we'll be back to first Wednesday starting in May. Now, this is a time when we would normally, well, we do our offering, we do it a little different. Some of us may be used to passing the bucket, we don't do that, but we do like to take a pause and just recognize that this is a part of our worship. It is an act of obedience that we do in our tithes and our giving. And for those of you who may be new, we just like to remind you of the easy ways to give. You can give online at lpcmentor.com. You can text the amount that you want to give to the number 84321. Our ushers have the red buckets in the back, and there are also giving stations in the lobby and in the overflow areas. That's all we have. Thanks again for being here today. It is an amazing day. Let's get back to our service. Well, good morning, Life Point. Thank you. Who was that that said good morning? One person. <laughs> good morning, Life Point. Good morning. Amen. It's so good to see each and every one of you. If you're visiting, this is your very first time. Welcome to Life Point Church. We have people everywhere right now, all throughout this building. We have people in the overflow, which we've had all weekend. And some have been willing to just give up their seat in here so that you could be in here. So would you let them know you appreciate them as well? And um, today actually marks 10 years. We launched our church 10 years ago. And um, so we give God all the praise and all the glory. And uh, he, he deserves it all. Amen. He really does. And um, so we're excited about this. We're excited about our future. We believe the best is yet to come. We really do believe that. And um, I don't know if you guys heard about the guy who took his wife and mother-in-law to Israel on, on a trip. And they were going to spend two weeks in, in Israel, the Holy Land. And um, two days into their trip, the mother-in-law unexpectedly passed away. And so they went, they were talking to the funeral director, and he said, well, he said, in order for us to ship her body home, it's going to cost $10,000. But if you would like, we could bury her, bury her here in the Holy Land. We'll give you a plot for $150. Father-in-law says, let me think about that for a minute. A couple minutes later, he said, no. He said, you know, I think we're going we're gonna to ship her home. And um, the director looked at him and he said, well, do you understand it's $10,000 to ship her home, 150, she could be buried in the Holy Land. You can make it an annual trip to come back. And he said, yeah, I get it, I understand. He said, but 2,000 years ago, they buried a man here and three days later, he got back up. <laughs> he said, I can't afford to take that chance. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I love my mother-in-law. I know my mother-in-law's watching. We love you, and we thank God for you. Well, he is risen. Jesus is alive and well, amen. He is risen. Let's go to Luke 24, Luke 24, and this is what it says, but early Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. Now, these were the original Spice Girls. <laughs> they found, it gets better, trust me. They found that the stone had been rolled away. So they went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there, puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen 
from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered. Oh, yeah, I remember that. So they rushed back to the tomb to the 11 disciples to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. Now, I want you to look at this next line. But the story sounded like nonsense to them. Now, these are the same men who spent three and a half years of their life with Jesus. And they said they didn't believe it. Father, we thank you and we praise you. We give you all the glory and we give you all the honor. Amen, amen. and amen. As I said, 10 years ago, we launched Life Point Church on Easter Sunday. And the message that I preached, some of you were there, the message that I preached was checkmate. And so you're going to see the chessboard, the makeshift chessboard here. And um, trust me, it's not the same sermon. Um, but Spurgeon said, if a sermon's worthy of preaching one time, it's worthy to be preached a thousand times. So I'm not a chess guy. I'm more of a checkers guy. Any chess people in the room today? What about down on in the overflow? Any couple of you I see? Um, Chess is a game of thought. It's a game of strategy. It's a game where you have to be constantly thinking ahead for the next move, several moves ahead. As a matter of fact, they tell us that great chess players can think 10 to 15 moves ahead while anticipating what their opponent is going to do as well. So it's a, great, a game of wit. It's a game of strategy, but the goal is to surround the king. Am I right, chess players? The goal is to surround the king, and when the king has no more moves, nowhere else to go, the game is over, and the winner says, checkmate. They say checkmate, and once checkmate is declared, that means the game is over. There's a painting I want you to see, and um, we're going to look at this painting right now. And this painting represents on the um, left represents the devil, the feather in his hat, and he's playing chess against this young man. And um, you can see that he's glaring at this young man. Um, he's got this arrogance about him, and um, the opponent seems dejected, disheartened, and it appears as though it's checkmate. You look at the board, it appears as though the game is over. And so for centuries, people have said that chess is a lot like life. In fact, one of the great chess masters was asked, what is chess? And he responded, what is life? Because it feels like your entire life is a series of moves against the world. And sometimes it feels like against an enemy. And the longer you play this game, the longer you live, it almost seems as though things are closing in. It almost seems as though in certain seasons of your life, you have no more moves to make. And it seems as though that life and the enemy is screaming to you, checkmate. So for a lot, of, a lot of us, this is how life feels. All hope is lost. The game of life is over. There isn't another move that I can make. I feel trapped. I feel like there's no way out and I feel like it's checkmate for my life. And some of you may feel that way today. Some of you may be here today and you feel like you're in a relational checkmate. I mean, the marriage 
is already hanging on by a thread. You've tried everything you know to do. You've, you've, you've done everything possible, and it feels like I'm just out of options. I don't know what else to do. And then there are others that are here, and you feel like you're at a financial checkmate in your life. Um, things are tight. The bills keep closing in on you. You're surrounded by this mountain of debt, and you have more month than you have money, and it just seems as though there's a checkmate being declared over your finances. For some, it might be health. You've tried your whole life to live healthy, to do right things, to get the right results, and all of a sudden you get a report back that says it's cancer. And it seems like you're hearing the word checkmate. And there may be somebody online, there may be someone in the overflow room that you're dealing with addiction or a loved one is dealing with addiction. And so the numb, to numb the pain and, and to hide the shame, they find themselves ensnared and trapped in an addiction. And then let's just broaden it out for a minute. And let's just think about our nation. When we think about our nation and everything that's going on in our world today, it seems as though the enemy is laughing and declaring checkmate over our nation. And you may feel like you're in an impossible situation, but here's what I want you to realize today, and that is this. We worship a God of the impossible. We worship a God of the impossible. As a matter of fact, the Bible is filled with people, just like you and I, dealing with life experience, who, who entered into seasons of their life where it seemed as though it was checkmate. One of those would be Abraham and Sarah. They were at a checkmate time in their life. See, they were believing God for a child. God had promised them a child. 25 years had gone past. And now they're at a point where he's 99, she's 90, and they're feeling like it is impossible for God to fulfill his promise of a child. But because of their age and their circumstance, it seemed hopeless and it seemed helpless. And then God asked them a rhetorical question. This is what he asked them. Is there anything too hard for me? And the answer is categor categorically, no, there is nothing too hard for the Lord. How many of you really believe that today? How many of you believe that there's really nothing too hard for the Lord? Job found himself in a check checkmate season of his life. If you're familiar with the story of Job, he lost his health. He lost his wealth. He lost his family. He buried 10 children in one day. He lost his friends. And it even appeared as though he had lost his God. He said at one time, he said, I looked to the left and I couldn't find him. I turned to the right and he wasn't there. I looked behind me and he wasn't there. And it was like, God, where are you? I feel as though you have abandoned me. And then God comes to him and through a series of questions about creation and about the power and the majesty of God, Job finally gets to the place in Job 42 and 2 where he says this, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. You see, I think that's what God is trying to get across to us today on this resurrection morning. I think God is trying to reiterate to us that there's nothing too hard for him that there's nothing impossible for him, that he can do anything. You know, other religious leaders' tombs are famous for what remains in them. For instance, Buddha or Confucius or Muhammad. But the tomb that held the body of Jesus is not famous for what was in it, but it's famous for what's not in it because it is the only tomb that's famous 
for what's not in it. Because Jesus did something that no one else has ever been able to do. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Confucius, not any other, not any other self-proclaimed spiritual Messiah. No one was able to conquer death, hell, and the grave. None but Jesus. Amen. The tomb of our Savior is empty, and the King Jesus is alive and well this resurrection morning. That's why we're here today. Because if it would have ended on Friday, there would be no reason for us to be here today. But because it didn't end on Friday, and because Sunday happened, there is a reason for us to be here today. And the reason is Jesus, and the reason is God is still at work in our lives. Amen? Listen, if you don't hear anything else this morning, if you don't take away anything else today, if you check out for the rest of the service, I want you to remember this, this thing right here. I want you to write it down, online church, type it in the comment section. I want you to write this down. Because the tomb is empty, anything is possible. Amen. See, we're trying to build our faith. And because the tomb is empty, you have to tell yourself that. Because the tomb is empty, anything is possible. You know what? In, in the scripture that I read to you, the angels come to the tomb. And they're, uh, as, as the women come to the tomb, the angels are there. They appear to them. And the angels are a little bit perplexed. And the angels are like, how did you miss this? He told you what was going to happen. He told you that he would be rejected. He told you that he would be forsaken. He told you that he would be beaten. He, he told you everything that, that, that you saw on Friday. He said that was going to happen. It had to happen. But he also told you that on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. And, and the angel was like, we expected you guys and the disciples to be by the tomb on Sunday morning. And we expected you to be there with a countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, move that bus. <laughs> right? That's what they, they, they were saying. We, don't you remember? He said this was going to happen. And I think a lot of times that happens to us in life. I think we see circumstances, and we see circumstance, circumstances over promises. And I want you to know something. Circumstances can change, but God's word never changes. The truth will always be the truth, amen? And if God promised you something, if God spoke to you from his word, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It, you can even bury it. God has the ability and the power to resurrect it. Amen. I was hoping you'd be a little more excited about that. The first service was, no pressure there, but the first service was a little more receptive on that one. Amen. See, you have to understand that all things are possible. Because many times you can hear all the things and miss the main thing. They heard it all, but they missed the main thing. And you, wanna, you know, your enemy wants you to think that you're out of moves. The devil uses deceit to trap us. He uses deceit to corner us, to deceive you into thinking there is no way out of this. I don't know uh, about you, but I've been in situ situations in my life where I felt like there's no way out of this. I, I'm out of moves. There's nothing else I can do. And then the devil whispers in your ear, You've gone too far, haven't you? You've done too much. You failed too many times. Because the Bible says this, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So it doesn't even have to be true for you to believe it. If you believe it, then it becomes true to you. Even if it's a lie, it becomes truth to you because as a man thinks, so is he. 
So if the devil can get you to believe and buy into a lie, he will then bury you in a tomb of hopelessness where the truth, like the disciples, sounds like nonsense to you. That's impossible. There's no way that could ever happen. This is, this is too far gone, and there's no way that God can take this and turn it around. See, the battle between the devil, who is defeated, and Jesus, who is victorious, is not a battle for power, okay? Jesus said, all power and all authority has been given unto me. So how much does that leave the devil? You're a sharp group. If all power and authority has been given, how much does that leave the devil? None. So he has to tell lies to deceive us into thinking that it is true. So we're not talking about a battle between power. That's not what we're talking about. The battle that you and I are facing today is a battle for truth. And who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe God's report? Are you going to believe the enemy's report? You have to believe that all things are possible. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself told us this. If you read John or Mark chapter 9, there's a story in Mark chapter 9 where this, where this man has a son who's demon-possessed. And the Bible said that that demon would take his son and throw him in the fire. He would take his son and throw him in the water to try to destroy him, to try to kill him. He had no control over this thing. And he brought, he brought his son to his disciples, and the disciples couldn't do anything with him. And so then they brought him to Jesus, and the father said, Lord, if you can do anything. And Jesus said, wait a minute. What do you mean if I can do anything? I'm in Mark 9, 23 now. He said, what do you mean if I can do anything? Jesus said, anything is possible if that person believes. Anything is possible if that person believes. So Jesus said, it's not on me, it's on you. And if you have faith enough to believe in me, then anything is possible. So then Paul comes along in Philippians 4, 13, and Paul says this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This scripture always threw me. And it threw me because of the word things. Because I've tried to dunk a basketball. <laughs> you can tell I am vertically challenged. So when he says you can do all things, well, I can't dunk a basketball. It, praise God. <laughs> then you and I are not going to be on the same team. <laughs> so you think about that scripture and you think about your life and you think about things you can't do. So then why would God come along and tell us, you can do all things through me who strengthens you? If you really want to know a more accurate translation of this scripture, you have to read verse 12 of this, this particular passage of scripture. Because Paul talks about seasons of his life. He talked about times where he was struggling to make ends meet. He said, I was in seasons of my life where, where I was in lack. I didn't have enough. And then he talks about seasons of his life where he had plenty. He had more than enough. And what he was telling us is he's saying, listen, your life is like seasons. You go through certain seasons of your life, and what you have to understand is there's not one season in your life that you can't get through through the strength of Jesus. So whatever season you find yourself in spiritually, you have to understand you can make it through that season because just like in the natural, so in the spirit, your seasons in life are going to change. You're not always going to be on the mountain. There are times you're going to be in the valley. There are times you're going to be walking through the valley of the shadow of death, and it's not easy. But there are times you will be on the mountain. And so for you, if you're here today, and you're in a crucible season of your life, 
You're in a time of trials and tests. You're in a time of adversity and storms. And you're like, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this. Yes, you are. Because you can get through any season in your life as long as Jesus is leading you through that season. And here's what Easter teaches us, that you can go through a crucible season of your life and live to tell about it. Oh, I need some help right here. You can go through a difficult, trying time in your life and live to tell about it. Amen. Amen. The Bible said that Noah lived 130 years after the flood. Do you realize there's life after the flood? There's life after your storm. But the devil would try to get you to think that you're always going to be here, that there's no way out. You might as well quit. You might as well throw in the towel. You might as well give up because this is how it's always going to be. Checkmate. But if you're going through a crucible season of your life, you have to understand what is next. And what is next is resurrection. Come on, resurrection is next. So when you go through and the enemy says you're buried, you have to understand, nope, I'm going to come out of this. I'm going to get up out of this in Jesus' name. This is not going to last forever. Amen. This season will change, and I will have a resurrection season in my life. It is coming. Hold on. Sunday's coming. Listen, we say it all the time in reference to Jesus. Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. Well, guess what? Sunday's coming for you too. Sunday's coming for me too. Sunday is coming for us. In other words, there is a get back up day coming in our lives, and your life isn't over, and my life isn't over until God says it is. So it is a battle for truth. It is a battle for, tr- battle for truth. So you can be in a tomb, but hold on because you're going to get on top. Because what's after resurrection? Ascension. And I don't have time to go through the cycles of life of celebration. When Jesus entered into Jer- Jerusalem, Hosanna, Hosanna. It's the celebration seasons of your life. And then the rejection seasons of your life. I don't know him. Want nothing to do with him. Leading in the crucifixion season, leading into resurrection season, leading into ascension. That's life. Those are the cycles and seasons that we go through. Don't get locked in to thinking it's checkmate. The death of Jesus was not the end of Jesus. Jesus said, it is finished. He didn't say, I am finished. Come on. He said, it is finished. I'm not finished. And if he's not finished, that means you're not finished. That means there's hope for you today. That means there's there's life for you today. I want you to look at this scripture because Paul tells us about this life that you and I can have. Listen to what it says in Romans 8, 11. He says, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. Okay? Are we clear with that? Lives in you. Not an angel, not the third cousin of Jesus, but the same Spirit lives in you. And just as God raised Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. You know what this verse is telling us? This verse is telling us that Easter is not just something that you celebrate, but Easter could be something that you can experience. There's resurrection power available to each and every one of us today. There's resurrection power available to take an impossible situation in our life and make it possible. 
The same spirit that raised the three dead day body of Jesus back to life is the same spirit living on the inside of us. I don't, I don't think we fully understand who's living in us. I don't think we fully understand the power that is residing on the inside of us. And if I ever get a revelation of this, if I understand that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is operating in my life too, if I ever get that revelation in understanding, what that tells me is this. There's hope no matter what situation I find myself in. So, so if my marriage is hanging on by a thread, God can resurrect that marriage. If my finances are ruined, God can resurrect those finances. Come on. If your health seems like it's over, God can resurrect your health. God can deliver you or anyone else from an addiction. And yes, God can save this nation. Amen. Because it's not checkmate on this nation right now. I just want you to know that. Jesus said it is finished. He didn't say I'm finished. Amen. And because he's not finished, he's not finished with us either. Amen. Just nudge your neighbor and tell him there's hope. There's hope. There's hope. Come on, overflow. There's hope. Say this with me. Anything, anything is possible. possible. Now look at your neighbor and tell them, anything, anything is possible. Do you believe that today? Yes. Come on, do you believe that today? Yes. Guys, if you put that painting back up, I want to just share something with you as I close. You believe that? I'm closing. <laughs> I told you anything was possible. You just didn't believe. This picture was hanging in the Louvre in Paris, and chess champions from all over the world were there for a tournament. And so they had taken time to go through the museum, and all the champions were walking through, and they come across this picture. They stayed there, and they looked at it for a while. And they just moved on to other pictures and other things in the museum. But one champion stayed behind, and he looked at it. An hour went by, and he's still looking at this picture. True story. He's still looking at this picture. And it dawned on him. He said, the painting is wrong. The painting is wrong. Hey, keep that door shut for me until I'm done, please. The painting is wrong. He said, the painter got it wrong. He missed it. And by that time, he's shouting it, it's wrong. So some of the other players come back, and he said, that painting's not right. He said, it's, it's titled Checkmate, meaning game's over. He said, but I'm looking at it, and I want you to know that the king still has one more move. Oh, you missed a place to shout. I said you missed a place to shout. You remember Jesus, don't you? Put a crown of thorns on his head, nailed his hands to a cross, pierced his feet, pierced his side, mocked him, ridiculed him, spat on him, made fun of him, took him down, put him in a tomb, and hell had a party, one of those all-night Lionel Richie parties, <laughs> all night long, all night Friday night, silent Saturday, and hell was partying, and this is what they were saying, checkmate, and they were going by, this is my version, high-fiving each other, checkmate, checkmate, checkmate. And then God says, I don't think so, because Sunday's here. Come on, stand to your feet as you're giving the Lord praise. I don't think so. You want to know why? Because the king still has one more move. Do you believe that today? 
I said, do you believe that today? I want you to know in your life, I don't care how bad it looks. I don't care how hopeless it appears. I don't care how many reports you get. The king still has one more move. <laughs> All things are possible. All things are possible. I don't have time to talk to you about the miracles personally and that I know of. But all things are possible. Mom, Dad, don't give up on him. All things are possible. Yeah. Married couples, don't give up on each other. It's possible. It's possible. Don't you dare give up on this nation. As long as you're here, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is here. Amen. Don't you believe the lie. Don't you believe it. Amen. All things are possible. Now, this only applies to those who have received Jesus in their heart. That's, that's how you have the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, is you have to ask him into your heart and into your life. So at this moment, I'm going to take the opportunity through an invitation for you to receive Jesus into your heart. Maybe you're here and you used to serve the Lord, and we've had people all weekend give their heart to the Lord. From Friday to the first service today, and here you are now. And maybe you used to serve the Lord and you're just backslidden. You know you're not, right? You know, you know you're not serving God. You just know it. And you're blocking God's move in your life. Sin is separating you from him. That's why he died. So that we could get it covered with the blood. Amen? So I'm not going to ask you to bow your head, and I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes. Because he didn't die in private. He died and was crucified in public. And if we can't acknowledge him here in this setting, we'll never acknowledge him out there. Amen? Never. So if you're in this room today, and you need Jesus in your life, and you know you do, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to pray with you. And then God's got another move for your life. So if that's you, on the count of three, I just want you to lift up your hand. Don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated. Don't be ashamed. We've all been here. One, two, three. Just shoot it up all over the building. They're going up. Come on, put your hands together. Come on, all over the building. They're going up. Come on. Hey, just leave them up. I'm gonna, I, I, I just want you to leave them up. And the reason I want you to leave them up is because he left his hands up. Thank you. Thank you. You can put them down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is what we've been praying for. This is what we've been fasting for. For you. It's not so that we can have a big crowd. It's so that people would come to the saving knowledge and grace of Jesus. Because the only thing we're taking with us to heaven are people. Yes. That's it. People. So one more time, I'm going to give you an opportunity. And if you raise your hand, I want you to raise it again. One, two, three, just raise it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray.
Repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I ask you now, forgive me of my sins. Wash me in your blood. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose on the third day. I believe you're coming very soon. And I want to be right. And I want to be ready. So I receive you now as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for dying for me. I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. And from this moment on, I'm going to serve you. And when I fail, I'm going to get back up because the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me, and He can pick me back up from any failure and any sin in my life. Jesus, I thank you for saving me. It makes me so happy. I want to shout. Listen, thank you for coming today. Thank you for celebrating the resurrection with us today. If you prayed that prayer, we would love, we would love to connect with you. We have some information we want to give you. If you want more prayer, we have people that all week have been praying for you and are here to pray with you. So if you'll just wait until the everybody kind of gets out or you want to come to the altar, you can do that as well. We're here to pray with you or just stay in your seat. Someone will get to you. But we thank you again for being with us today. Remember this as you leave. 
the king still has one more move and anything is possible for them who believe we'll see you right here next sunday light point church